All right, well, we're back into our look at the first epistle of the Apostle John. We're going to start off in chapter number three uh, in this lesson. Uh, in the United States Treasury Department, you have those who work there whose expertise is in tracking down, locating, and then destroying uh, counterfeit bills. Now, you may think, well, they're probably having to study counter, counterfeit bills every day. And actually, that's the complete opposite. Uh, they don't find these counterfeit bills by studying counterfeit bills. They find the counterfeit bills by studying the real ones. Okay. Uh, anybody in uh, even like the diamond industry, it's the same thing. If you study the real real diamonds, then you'll be able to see a fake one rather easily. Okay, so the more you study the Word of God, the easier it will be for you to spot a counterfeit Christian. The more you study the Word of God, the easier it will be for you to spot a counterfeit Christian. Wiersbe comments, he says, a counterfeit Christian may talk about God and get involved in religious activities, but he does not really know God. The person who has been born of God through faith in Christ knows God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And because he knows them, he lives a life of obedience. He does not practice sin. Okay. Uh, so John is addressing in his letter those who had left the community. We're not talking about those who had a disagreement, those who perhaps moved. We're talking about John is addressing those who left the community of faith because they never actually truly believed it, that Yeshua was the Messiah. That he was who he said he was. He was the Son of God. They never believed it, and so they left. And when they left, now they were trying to persuade others to leave the community of faith as well. And now you're going to see John addressing that matter. Those who had left and now are trying to get others and persuade others to do the same. So Guzik writes, he says, most people understand that the important things in life are not things at all. They are the relationships we have. God has put a desire for relationship in every one of us a desire he intended to be met with relationships with other people, but most of all, to be met by a relationship with him. In this remarkable letter, John tells us the truth about relationships and shows us how to have relationships that are real for both now and eternity. So now we're going to be getting into chapter 3. You're going to see that not only the power of God's love that saved us, but it's also that very same love that preserves us. We call it in theology, the perseverance of the saints. Those who truly belong to him, those who are truly born again, will exhibit and show a love for him, a love for his word, a love for God's people. They will be obedient to him. They will be obedient to God's word. And so, on to verse number one. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. So, the grace which was freely bestowed upon us is truly beyond our comprehension. John chapter 1, verses 11 through 13, he came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So he says, see how great a love, agape, and that particular kind of love. Again, you see the word love in the English uh, a number of times in your scriptures, but there are various different Greek words for that English word love. In this verse, he's talking about agape love, which is a sacrificial love. 
And it's one, it's a term that is truly a favorite of John's. So he says, see how great of love the Father has bestowed, which when you think of something that's been bestowed, it's something that you have not earned. You can't earn it. And the love which he bestows upon you and upon me, it changes us. And it changes us from inside, from inside out. So see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God. Imagine, we have been adopted into his family. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17, For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption, as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Messiah, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may be also glorified with him. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Messiah, just as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through the Yeshua Messiah to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. All right. So if you see, there's a phrase, and such we are. Now, uh, I'm reading, of course, from the New American Standard. You see that phrase as well. I think it's in the ESV and a couple other English versions. That phrase is not found in later manuscripts. It's found in the older manuscripts. It's not found in the later. So as, the, as time went on, scribes took that phrase out. That's why if you have a King James Bible, it's not there. And such we are. But it's there in the older, in the older manuscripts. And really, it's an affirmation. Okay. Somebody may say... Uh, uh, that that man over there, lady may tell her, her her friend, that man over there is my husband. Or somebody says, I should say, uh, that man over there calls me his wife, and that I am. All right. So meaning that I am, it's a reality. It's a reality. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. So this final statement really uh, parallels the word, words of Yeshua himself. When he said in John chapter 16, verses 2 and 3, they will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. So for this reason, the world does not know us. Unbelievers, other than the fact that we're all in the human race, unbelievers have no relationship to us. There's no relationship to us. We don't belong to the same family. We don't have the same goals. We don't have the same desires. And if they die in the spiritual condition in which they are, we don't even have the same eternity. We have nothing in common with unbelievers. 1 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16, But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Messiah. So there are a number of times throughout the scriptures where we, uh, as believers, are referred to as pilgrims, as sojourners, as strangers, and the like. Hagen, in his commentary, writes, Thus, someone who professes to be a child of God through faith in Yeshua, but who seeks to be accepted by the world, shows themselves to be spurious in their faith. It is not that we seek to be persecuted or try to make ourselves unlikable in order to prove the genuineness of our faith. But the reality will be that if, as children of God, we seek to honor him by walking in his ways and living in accordance with his truths, then those who long to be accepted by the world will inevitably consider us as outsiders and as opposing the very lifestyle they desire. So there, there's a, there is a, you may call it a spiritual litmus test. You have the world and you have the children of God. 
Okay, so here's the litmus test. Which is attracted to you? That's the litmus test. The world, the children of God, which group is attracted to you? If the world is attracted to you, that's a problem. Evans writes, if you are a Christian, you have a perfect Heavenly Father who loves you and who doesn't share any of the failures of your earthly father. What's more, he's the king of creation. You are royalty. Nevertheless, do not be surprised when the world rejects you. It rejected God's son because it didn't know him either. You're in good company. On the other hand, if the world loves you, that's when you should worry. Verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. Notice the word now. Beloved, so he's addressing believers, now. The salvation that you and I have right, is not something that we're hoping for. I, I certainly hope when I die, I go to heaven. I hope that, you know, I've done enough good things in my life that God will look favorably upon me. Or God will look favorably upon him or her. No. Beloved, now we are children of God. We're not striving for that. For that eternity. For that everlasting life. We have it now. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And when someone doesn't have that kind of assurance, okay, either one or two things, either it could very well be they're just immature in the faith, they're new believers, and of course that will happen with a new believer, we call it a babe in Christ, or someone that's simply just not saved. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. In other words, that which cannot be fully known. Heg comments, he says, John's point is, in one sense, obvious. While we have the promise of immortality and eternity in the very presence of our Lord, an eternity that is entirely devoid of sin, sorrow, sickness, and death, along with everything that constitutes the brokenness of this world, we simply do not know what the days ahead hold for us as we await the coming of our Lord. So we don't know what the future holds for us. No one knows. No one knows what tomorrow looks like. You, may, you could very well plan for tomorrow. You could plan for, for perhaps the weekend or a trip or what have you. But there's no guarantee. We have no idea what tomorrow looks like. But we do know one thing. He is coming again. So that is something that is in the future that we know absolutely, which is true. He is coming again. We may not know what tomorrow looks like for us, but we know he's coming again. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning of verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. But we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. We will see him just as he is. The fall, the fall in the garden, has impeded the fellowship that we should be having with the Lord. But, praise be to Yeshua, his finished work on the cross, his resurrection and his ascension, our mortality will be transformed and we will be eternally free from sin and death. We will see him just as he is. The, the experience that Adam and Eve had with the Lord prior to the fall. It must have really, truly been something. 
Philippians 3, 20 and 21, for our citizenship is in heaven, but from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Yeshua Messiah, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Head comments, he says, by God's omnipotent power and mercy, through the work of Yeshua on our behalf, in his death, resurrection, and intercession, we will regain an even greater position than that which Adam and Eve had before the fall. For while Adam and Eve were created with the ability to sin, and thus to be separated from the very God who created them, such will never be possible for those who possess eternal life and who are therefore eternally the children of God. When mortal puts on immortality, we will never again be separated from God, for sin in its entirety will be done away with. In that day, there will not be an opportunity for us to sin. Not in those bodies. We will not be able to sin. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15.26 The last enemy will be abolished as death. And Guzik comments, he says, Heaven is precious to us for many reasons. We long to be with loved ones who have passed before us and whom we miss so dearly. We long to be with the great men and women of God who have passed before us in centuries past. We want to walk the streets of gold, see the pearly gates, and see the angels around the throne of God worshiping Him day and night. However, none of those things, precious as they are, make heaven really heaven. What makes heaven heaven is the unhindered, unrestricted presence of our Lord and to see Him as He will be the greatest experience of our eternal existence. Well said. Verse number 3, And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as he is pure. So the hope that we have, we're not wishing for it. It's an assurance. It's, a, it's an assurance in accordance with our faith. And as you mature and as you grow, the fears and the doubts will, will fade away and the, assur and the assurity and the assurance of heaven and glory and, and our Heavenly Father will become more and more prevalent as the days go by. The child of God purifies himself. In other words, his life. In that we may grow in conformity to Yeshua. Matthew 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 1 John 2, verse 6, The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So we talk about sanctification. When we live a sanctified life, we can anticipate his return and not be ashamed of it. Again, we can anticipate his return and not be ashamed of it when we're walking the way he walked. So we're not talking about salvation. You're already saved. You're talking about the walk. We know we will see him. The question that you and I have to ask ourselves every day, will, be, will we be ashamed when we see him? Philippians 3, 12 through 14, Not that I have already obtained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Messiah Yeshua. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Messiah Yeshua. J. Vernon McGee, he writes, There is nothing that should encourage holy living like the study of Bible prophecy. Today we see a lot of careless, slipshod living but also a great emphasis on prophecy. I hear people say, oh, I'm waiting for the Lord to come. Brother, my question is not whether you are looking for the Lord to come, but how are you living down here? How you live down here determines whether or not you are really looking for the Lord to come. 
Wiersbe comments, he says, an unbeliever who sins is a creature sinning against his creator. A Christian who sins is a child sinning against his father. The unbeliever sins against law. The believer sins against love. It's pretty powerful. Verse number four, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Everyone who practices. Now, the way John is writing that word that we see in the English practices, it's not in the Greek, but it is assumed and it denotes a characteristic action who practices sin. Okay, so even when we come to faith, we sin and we will continue to sin. But our sins shouldn't be characteristic of our lives. It shouldn't be a pattern. Are you, are you going to sin? Yes. But is it a pattern in your life? Does it trouble you when you do so? Does it, do you go to your Heavenly Father and do you confess the sin? Okay. So what we've seen, unfortunately, uh, as the years have gone on in our culture, especially here in the West, is that somehow, because the culture changes, what we've done is, as a culture, we've changed the definition of sin. God hasn't done it, but the culture has. And so now you take a, a sin, which has been a sin, and always will be a sin, you can, you can say homosexuality, for instance. Well, now, it, of course, in our culture, it's not a sin. But the Bible declares that it is. Okay. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Isaiah 53, 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Romans 8, 5 through 8, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So John is very clear as to what sin is. It is lawlessness. And lawlessness really, if you want to define it, simply means to negate the Torah, uh, namas, Torah. Uh, to negate the Torah is lawlessness. MacArthur comments, he said, the term lawlessness in conveys more than transgressing God's law. It conveys the ultimate sense of rebellion. In other words, living as if there was no law or ignoring what laws exist. James 4, verse 17, therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. And so you're seeing now, as he, he, uh, was, John had mentioned and had brought up the term Antichrist back in chapter 2, okay, the person who practices lawlessness is participating in the actual work of the Antichrist himself. It's a spirit. Uh, when we talk about Torah, for instance, and... We're going to be wrapping this up pretty soon. Uh, Haig makes a, an interesting comment uh, in, his, in his, uh, his commentary on this passage. Uh, where we talk about Torah. And uh, obviously, and it's unfortunate that many of our brethren in the Christian world would say, well, the Sabbath, you know, it was a shadow. The Sabbath was a shadow. Uh, it was ceremonial. And of course, when Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross and he rose again and he did away with the, he did away with the law, then he also did away with those ceremonial laws and the Sabbath being one of them. And so he brings this up and he mentions, he said, but the problem with that premise is that scripture describes profaning the Sabbath. Profaning the Sabbath. And so Tim is right. We're not talking the Sabbath day. We're talking about honoring the Sabbath day, keeping the Sabbath day, keep it holy. 
Is it so much ceremonial or is it moral? Because scripture describes profaning the Sabbath. So that's, that doesn't speak of ceremonial failure. That actually speaks of moral failure to profane the Sabbath. Romans 3, verse 31. Paul writes, do we then nullify the Torah through faith? He asks the question. Now that we've come to faith, what, you just throw all that out? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the Torah. So we've gotten through the first four verses of chapter number three. And uh, when we gather together once again, we'll pick it up in verse number five.